Uh, so today we're going to um, uh, enter a new chapter, the program chapter of the book, it's the third one. And uh, in the introduction, it kind of reminds us um, actually what, what programming is, that is, you know, uh, when you're programming, you import data and then you tidy them, and then you go to that loop of transforming and visualizing, modeling, and, you know, again and again, how many times it's any, any number, any n number of times that you need to, and then you communicate them. So the code uh, is a vehicle of communication, a way it means to communicate. And actually getting better in programming means that you are getting better in communicating. And uh, a very good thing to remember always is that even if you're not working with other people at any point, you're working with the future you. And this is why it's very important to have always comments in your code and try to uh, write as neatly as possible and avoid spaghetti code, you know, code that is difficult to maintain. And uh, it kind of uh, be, uh, it can be difficult to interpret later. Uh, also, I inserted here the, like that uh, Ernest Hemingway uh, quote that also applies to prose and coding that the only form of writing is rewriting that you know you have to do it sometimes and then go back and write in a better way. Uh, I do that a lot with my code, <laughs> uh, and yeah. So what? Uh, the, the writer points out here is that after finishing a data analysis or whatever, it's always good to take a look at your code and decide whether or not you're, what you've done is clear. And spending extra time on your code, especially when it's fresh in your mind, uh, when, you know, uh, because sometimes when you check your code after even, even a week, <laughs> it might be difficult to, to remember exactly what you've done. Uh, and this will save definitely lots of time and effort uh, when you want to recreate the code. And yeah, you should always remember to balance uh, what you need to do to achieve now with what would save you time in the long run. So you have to uh, try to be uh, as efficient, but at the same time, um, do your future self a favor and help, help yourself in the long term. So in this chapter, uh, what we will do is that we will learn how to use Pi, uh, how they work. Uh, well, it's actually the pipe, but we have some differentiation that we will see at the end, towards the end of the chapter. Um, when to use it and when not to use it and we'll learn about and then we'll move to functions, which is actually um, uh, for repeated code that, uh, and when we, when we write a function for repeated code, it's way easier to, re to reuse it. And it's a great way to substitute copy pasting, copy pasting code again and again in our, in our scripts that can be uh, error prone and can cause some um, uh, problems along the way. And uh, we'll also later learn about vectors, which is our structures. Uh, and uh, then we'll learn about iteration, which is basically loops uh, and tools that do similar things repeatedly, if not only loops. Um, so yeah, uh, here we have some conditions. Uh, you can check if you'd like. It's also in the main chapter if you want to check it out. So we're ready to start with pipes. That was the introduction of chapter three. And well, well let's check it out. Uh, we have those learning ob obje objectives to use the pipe operator to make our code more readable, actually. And we learn that, I don't think that we actually learned that, but it's the first time that I see it anywhere mentioned is about the left hand side of, uh, of our code of our uh, how to say um, of, of another function when you have like the um, 
oh my god how is it called the the symbol right the that thing how is it called in english it's the equal the equal sign yes yes equations when we have equations thank you shannon uh, it's like the left hand of the equation and the right hand the right hand side uh, it will come handy because uh, later in the let's say like in the pipe uh, variations let's say that there are some uh, other types of pipes like this is the the general one and we have also other types that it'll be useful to know the difference between the left hand side and the right hand side of the, of the code and then we'll recognize when it's not actually a good idea to use the pipe operator oper operator and um, lastly other pipe operators operators that might be helpful in our code and let's start just wait a minute to plug my computer in because it's gonna die All set. So the pipe operator is actually, um, it, it's not in base R. So you have to import the Magritte package, uh, which is by that guy here. And um, you, it's actually, I found it very, very, fine, very funny. That's why I mentioned it here, that they have named it after the René Magritte, uh, the guy who created this, uh, a painting here uh, that says Cecine uh, Bound Deep. This is not a pipe, anyway. But uh, yeah, so this is why they have named the, the packets Magritte. And it includes uh, the pipe operator and, uh, and also some other, the, the other alternative op operators that we will talk later. Uh, but uh, instead of uh, you know, loading the Magritte package and the library of uh, Magritte, uh, you can actually uh, use any type of the uh, pipes, the, yeah, any type of pipes if you have already loaded the diverse libraries. Uh, so yeah, if you have this loaded, you're good to go. And as you can see, when we run uh, this line of code here, the diverse packages include self. We can see that Magritte is here. So it's already imported and we don't have to do a lot. And now uh, what actually the pipe operator means. Uh, for us humans to make it easier to understand, it could be uh, translated, let's say semantically as and then. So it's as saying to our, code that take that and then do that and that and that and so it, it's it's like having a word to uh, actually uh, yeah no knowing what this would be translated to it helps us understand our code better um yeah this is not very important but i i heard that uh, uh, in the video of the previous uh, cohort, actually, that it kind of adds a tiny, teeny uh, overhead to the code because um, you need the packets to process your code when you have like that type of operas, operators. But uh, and if you have older versions of R, uh, it it won't work. There is um, that thing here that that is like the the old base R pipe. That you can use in that case is uh, in that case, but yeah, it seems that actually is a bit obsolete, and people prefer to use the this type, the, the new type of pipe anyway. But yeah, just a side note. So let's see what happens in code. And in the book, it has like that kind of weird example. But I prefer to use it here in case any of you have already checked the book. Uh, in the in the notes, um, they have actually changed the example. 
But anyway, once you get the idea, it's easier to, to understand. So let's see how it goes. Um, we have that old, uh, not old, but it's like a, a children uh, poem, actually. I had no idea of, uh, about the little bunny Fufu who went hoping through the forest, scooping up the field mice and bopping them on the head. And here, this uh, popular children poem apparently uh, is accompanied as it says by hand actions and it kind of tries in the book to uh, represent the little bunny Fufu encoding this poem. So it says that, okay, Fufu is like a little bunny. And then we will use a function for each of the key verbs mentioned in the poem, which is basically hope, scoop, and bow. And we're using the, these objects and the, the verbs, how can we um, try to um, represent this poem with code. We can save its intermediate step as a new object, uh, namely just to try and insert every time a new line of code. Rira overwrite the original object many times, taking one object and rewriting it over and over until the poem ends. Uh, we can compose function, uh, uh, functions or like a function to uh, work through that. We are gonna see it later or use a pipe. And we will start by doing each of these steps actually. Uh, so using with intermediate steps. Um, it's a very simple approach, probably the first that would come to anybody uh, that is new to programming, I think. It's like, just write fufu one, it's like, and then hop fufu through forest, and then fufu two, scoop fufu one up field mice, and then fufu three, bop fufu two on head. So it actually takes each one and then, you know, uh, works it through until the end. Uh, However, the downside of this form, as the I think it's pretty obvious, uh, is that uh, it's, uh, it can be complicated quite easily. Complicated quite easily because you use usually numeric suffixes to make the different names, um, and this way your code can be either cluttered with unimportant names, like what exactly does Fufu3 represents, right? It's, it kind of be tricky, especially if you have like more than three uh, elements. And also uh, you have to carefully increment the suffix on each line. So this means that if here, instead of two, I have one, I may just mess things up and I uh, have to check my code line by line again to try to figure out which line I have uh, mess, mess up. And this is actually what the writer says, that whenever I write this, I invariably use the wrong number of, on one line and then spend 10 minutes scratching my head and trying to figure out what, would, what went wrong with the code. And yeah, this is exactly what usually happens in this case. And this is the reason actually you'd better avoid it. And yeah, uh, after that, uh, uh, that section here, it had like um, a, a thing about mm, the memory, uh, how, how much memory does the pipe uses in R, but I thought that it's better to see it at the end of uh, 18 to chapter. We'll see it later anyway. So the other way to, to do that poem, to uh, write it in code, is by creating intermediate objects at its step. So create a fufu, hop fufu through forest, and then again, fufu, scoop fufu, up field mice, 
And then for the third one, Fufu, Bob, Fufu, on equals head. And this is less uh, typing, as it says, and probably less thinking. But again, it's very uh, error prone uh, because debugging can be very, very uh, hard and complicated. Uh, you have, uh, like, if you make an, a mistake, you have to rerun all uh, all the fun, or not functions, but all, all the code from the beginning or the pipeline. And again, the repetition of the object uh, obscures what's changing in this line. So it's not very easy to, to be understood if um, you're trying to, um, uh, how to say, yeah, if, you, if you're trying to understand what's going on, it's not very intuitive to, to get it. Uh, then another way that we can actually uh, try to, uh, uh, yeah, make that poem as, as code is to make a function composition, uh, like nest all the, the things that, that are happening in one um, big function. So Bob and then Scoop and then Hope and all of that with Fufu through Forest and, the, and everything is assigned on the right um, argument, I think. Uh, is it called argument? I'm not sure. Like the pop and scoop and pop. And in this case, even though this is uh, more common in languages like JavaScript and C++, um, you have to read it uh, from inside out or right to left. And again, it's not very um, uh, intuitive to understand what's going on. It's a bit uh, more difficult to read through it. And this is, again, called as the Dagwood sandwich problem, which I had no idea what, what it meant, but apparently this is a Dagwood sandwich, and it means that you have too much filling on the code, and it's, uh, you know, too long arguments, actually, uh, that are difficult to be understood. So, yeah, it's, it's a code hard for humans to consume. And last, last uh, uh, al no, alternative for this poem to come to life is to use the pipe. So what we're doing in this case, we're taking the fufu and we're saying, and then run hop through the forest and then fufu scoop up equals field mice and then fufu bob on equals head. And as it points out, uh, it actually, if compared to all the previous alternatives that we saw is the most neatly written and probably the, the easiest to actually uh, understand. And as it says here, it focuses on the verbs, not nouns. And this means that um, you can read this series of function compositions like it's a set of uh, imperative functions. So uh, you, you kind of uh, understand that fufu hopes and then scoops and then bobs. It's you know, easier to be interpreted. Uh, even though, as it says, you have to be familiar with the pipe, because if you don't know that, that, that symbol, what it signifies, and um, actually before doing this chapter, and I knew that this was a pipe, but again, the first time I, have it, I had encountered, I encountered it in a code script, I was like, what is that? I mean, if you don't know it, it might be uh, a bit of uh, a new thing that kind of confuses you. Uh, but in any case, uh, it's very easy uh, to, to pick it up. Once you know what, what it means and what it does, uh, it's uh, very easy to understand it. And 
even when you share your code with people that you're not sure if they know what this means, um, in the end, it, it's not a big deal. They kind of get it. Um, so a note again that was kind of important is that the pipe works by performing a lexical transformation, let's say. So um, it resembles the code in the pipe to form that works by overriding an in intermediate object. Uh, and now here it kind of shows what the, um, uh, the above uh, code implemented that it's actually like having uh, a function, creating a function, my pipe, and, and here creates like uh, a function, as I said, and it says that do that and then do that and that. And here has my pipe foo foo. So inserts in that function the, the bunny, the foo, and it runs uh, this function by and so this is like how it works i don't know if that was clear uh, at first i had a difficulty understanding what exactly especially that part was but uh, i think that uh, here actually the dot signifies that you can insert any name anything that could uh, any uh, argument that you want to run this function on and yeah and then just it does hope and then scoop and then both um any questions this far or i can then continue with the um, cases that that the pipes won't work actually because we have two types of functions Classes of functions actually that the pipes will work. All good. Okay. So uh, yes. Okay. Thank you, Daniel. Daniel, for the um, the verification because I I wasn't sure. I usually see it as three dots, but I guess that even the one dot here signifies that like the one thing that you would insert. So uh, the pipe will work for two classes of functions. And this is for functions that use the current environment. For example, the assign function that actually creates a new variable with the given name that you signify in it case in the current environment. I also didn't know that, uh, and I still am not sure what it means, create a variable in the current environment. I mean, I don't know why and what's, what's the difference with just creating a variable. But uh, the assign function has this uh, structure. So you have a sign, and then you name the, uh, the variable. You have, for example, here x. And then you have, uh, you know, what you want x to be. Uh, oops, this should be like below that. And, you know, then you type x and you have, it should be like that. I don't know why it's not like a, anyway. Um, and then you have an X that is assigned the value 10. But if you try to do it with the pipe, so you write um, X and then you have the pipe and then you write assign 100, and then you try to check what X has inside it, you'll see again that it's 10, which means that the, um, that this line didn't work at all. And actually X is still 10 as it was in the previous uh, assign function that you've run. 
And as it says, the use of a sign with a pipe does not work because it assigns it to a temporary environment uh, used by the, the pipe. And so what it basically says that you can do to work around this problem is to specify the environment that n is the environment. And now you can use the pipe uh, for the assigned function saying that x, uh, assign x, let's say, uh, 100 and specifying then that the environment is n. And now if you check uh, the value of x, you'll see that it's 100. I don't know why anybody would like to do that. It sounded very complicated to actually be useful. I, I don't know. I don't know what uh, in your experience this could be useful in any case. But anyway, uh, the, um, uh, the bottom line is that functions as a sign are not the ideal candidates to use pipes with. <laughs> and that's what it says that other functions with this problem is get and load. So you could probably just uh, find other, way, other ways to uh, use these functions instead of using pipes. Uh, and then uh, another class of functions that is not, again, uh, an ideal uh, candidate for using pipe with is the lazy evaluations functions. And this type of functions apparently is, um, uh, is actually a function whose arguments are only computed when the, functions, the function needs them. So they're not computed in advance, but only uh, when they come handy to of, to the function, not prior, as it says, to the calling of the function. And this, uh, an example of this type of function is the try catch, which is a, a function used to identify errors in the code. I, I haven't used it in real life, but it might be useful because it as far as I understood from my search, uh, is used to identify uh, problematic parts in your syntax. So here it says try catch, stop, um, and mark. And when, when it stops, uh, the stop function stops the execution of the code. And then the error is actually the message uh, that you um, that it will show up uh, when the code when the execution stops. So if you write if you uh, run this line here, you will get like an error. And but what's what's the problem if you use the, the pipe here, so you have stop, and then exclamation mark, and then the pipe, and, and then try catch error equals function e, uh, an error. This is the, um, the output. So error in a line, uh, because it cannot actually understand what is going on. Um, again, I am not sure how exactly this, um, why you would like to, to use the pipe in this case, even if it makes things easier in any way. But yeah, it says that with this type of functions that the arguments are not computed when beforehand, it's better to, to avoid it. And it says that other functions that have 
similar issues are try and suppress messages and suppress warnings. And, and this is the, the cases that you're not advised uh, to, to use pipes. And right after that, I have inserted that uh, part uh, about the, the memory and if and how piping affects uh, the, R, the memory of your uh, of R, uh, which is, I think, nothing really important uh, to worry about. But anyway, we can just take a look. Um, so it says here that you any somebody could worry about uh, about memory issues, uh, meaning that uh, maybe the pipe creates too many copies of your data and takes up a lot of memory. And uh, as it says, surprisingly, that's not the case. Um, and as we see here, um, that it has an example. Uh, it's we have like diamonds, and then it uses ggplot2 uh, and calls diamonds. Um, yeah, it uses double colon to access the exact function from the ggplot2, and and then he creates diamonds2, which is diamonds, and then uh, the I'm not sure how to pronounce that. And it uses again mutate and it adds a column here price per carat and its price divided by carat. And then it uses this library, the PREER, uh, which uh, actually uh, calculates the, the size. Um, the memory size of, um, I'd say, of, of the previous uh, arguments. So you have the object size of diamonds, um, which is 3.46, and diamonds 2, which is 3.89. And then if you try to check the size of both diamonds and diamonds two, it's 3.89, uh, which is kind of weird if you think about it, because it means that uh, the diamonds alone is a bit less than uh, diamonds two alone, but both those uh, are equal to the diamonds two, which doesn't make sense. But the reason for that is that um, actually R um, doesn't have to uh, duplicate all the data because they share a lot of columns. Actually, it has 10 columns in common with diamonds. So the two data frames have many variables in common and it doesn't need to store uh, these variables as duplicates. And it says that this variable will only get copied if you modified one of them. And that's what it does to the following example here. It takes diamonds carat and it um, actually changes it to, uh, to nothing, basically. Uh, and then if you check uh, diamonds it will be 3.46 and diamonds to 3.89 and combined they would be 4.32 which is a bit you know more normal more what we would expect and uh, yeah and here just a note that we use that prior thing the prior library and not the object size uh, because it takes a single object and um, and we could not calculate the, the combined size. Anyway, I felt that this was a bit, you know, 
Yeah, not very important. It would be, you know, interesting for discussion about how R actually treats the objects that you um, insert. But other than that, yeah, it didn't add anything, especially to the pipe. Uh, to understanding uh, the pipe and how it works and all that. So with that said, uh, we can, I think we can now check when not to use pipe. We said in which cases we, it's not uh, the best way to, uh, it's not the best idea to use it, but now uh, it's the cases that we're strongly advised uh, probably not to try and use pipe. So as it's you know, obvious, uh, pipe is a powerful tool, but uh, uh, it doesn't mean that it can solve uh, any problem. You know, it's not a panacea. So pipes are most useful for rewriting uh, something that is comparatively short and uh, it contains more of linear uh, operations. And this is why when pipes are longer than 10 steps, uh, it might be better not to use pipes because um, it might make debugging more difficult. And it might also, in the end, not help us understand the code. So, um, it might ma make more, uh, more sense to, to create intermediate objects with meaningful names. Instead of using like a very long pipe, try to you know, break down the code in smaller, uh, meaningful objects. And then uh, another case that we might rethink of using a pipe is when we have multiple inputs or outputs and um, you know uh, if there isn't one primary object that is actually being transformed as it says here uh, but two or more uh, it might get complicated and again uh, it's it's not um, it's not the best thing to do to use a pipe it may may make our our life harder in the end and uh as it says here the the last case that uh it's probably uh not the best case to use uh um a pipe is when you have a, a complex dependency structure because uh, pipes are um primarily linear and they have trouble to express um, complex relationships uh, that are in, that you see that you find in dependency structures. So whatever is not linear uh, in a linear sequence or is quite short is probably not the best fit to use pipes with. And um, I think that uh, I will ask so far what you want to do. So now we're going to the, we're moving, let's say, to the last part of the, of this part of chapter three on pipes. And uh, here we are introduced to other tools from the Magritte package. And um, as it says that uh, the main element is the pipe operator that you have already in the tidyverse, uh, but there are also some other useful tools in that package that it might come handy at any point. And um, yeah, one of them is what they call a T pipe and is uh, like that, it's, uh, it has actually a T somewhere in the operator. And here, what it says that it returns the left-hand side instead of the right-hand side 
side and um, it's called T because it's literally a T-shaped pipe. And again, what I read about that, because I couldn't understand it exactly at first, is like it works as in plumbing when you have like a T pipe, an actual one that it goes down and then up again, sort of. And uh, you can see here that you run that code here. So uh, you take random 100 random, um, uh, I'd say like um, points, and then you uh, make matrix, and then you uh, with two columns, yes, and then you plot it and you have that. And if you have like a pipe here to see the structure of your um, of your data, you'll see that, okay, you'll have the plot, but this one here, it will return null because, you know, it doesn't make sense. And then structure what? It doesn't understand, right? But if you use the T-pipe that would allow you to see the data prior to plotting, and again, you run, you, you write R norm 100, uh, again, is uh, random points that you take, uh, matrix with two columns, and then you use the T-pipe. So it does plot the, the plot and the scatter plot, and then it checks the structure of the left hand side, for, like on the of the norm um, of the R norm of the distrib not distribution, but of the of the points that you have assigned earlier. So you get the plot, and you also get the numbers, like that is one. 50 and one, two, and then blah, blah, blah. Um, again, it might not be uh, the, uh, it, it might be useful in very specific situations. I, I heard, for example, in the previous cohort that John commented that in three years of using R, he might have used it like two times. So yeah, it might be in very specific cases that it might come handy, uh, but it's good to know that it exists, that you can actually, instead of going only forward, like uh, to the right-hand side, you can also go to the left-hand side with that T-pipe. And, and then we have the exposition pipe. What is that exactly? Is when actually you explode, let's say, you explode out the variables in the data frame so you can refer to them explicitly. Uh, again, I don't know in which cases this might be super useful. Uh, we have, for example, here empty cars and then the exposition pipe. Uh, and then we have a correlation between um, uh, these two arguments. And it basically prints out the correlation. That's what it does. It, um, it just prints the, the correlation of the empty cars. And Lastly, we have the assignment pipe, which actually allows us to replace code. So we can have uh, empty cars like here, and we actually say that take empty cars and, uh, and, and then transform it to that uh, uh, make that transformation and change it actually. And another way to, to do it and reduce the, the lines of our code is to use the assignment pipe. So call empty cars and transform it to that. 
And as the book points out, this operation, this operator might not be, um, I have to say, like not useful. It might be. It would come uh, handy at some point, but uh, it it's better probably to to be clearer and more explicit when you um, when you substitute. Uh, variables. So even uh, if you need to duplicate something, uh, it's probably better and just to make the, the assignment more explicit, just to make clearer what is going on. Uh, because otherwise it might be difficult to be interpreted and yeah, might not be the best way to, to do it, it might be confusing. And yeah, this is the pipes uh, chapter actually. And then we have the functions. Um, any comments up until now? Anything that you want to? I think that was, that was good when I first started and I'm still learning R, but it was whatever, however I started, it was, they were using pipes right off the bat. So I just thought that was something that was part of R. Like I didn't, I didn't realize until you just said that it's not part of base R. And that makes that kind of is like a realization for me because I tried a few times early on just putting in the pipe operator and I would get an mm -hmm. error message. Like it was before yeah. I loaded tidyverse or any of that stuff. So that that's that makes a lot of sense, and I'm glad you cleared that up. And I I kind of was under the assumption, like I learned about them right off the bat, and I thought it was like you just use them for everything. You know, I didn't realize that. Me it, too. But, that that was my impression as well. That you could use it like a, everywhere. That it's yeah. better to use it than not actually. Right, right. And that's why I was like, yeah, it's like you should use pipes everywhere. And I also like that section where it's like when to not use it. Because that, mm. that clears up a lot of things too, because I'm like, oh, that makes sense that you wouldn't, that it's linear. And it's, if anything that's not linear, like it can just get really confusing and not really make sense. So that was, that was like an eye opener for me. I, um, yeah, that was, that was good. You explained that well. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm happy about that. I mean, it, it was not like a super long chapter or very complicated, but it had some parts that, you know, you had to, check them up a bit. I, I did, I had to, because even though I, 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 I'm also learning R, as you said, so I'm not, you know, a super, an, an expert on it. And I still have to check some stuff. And also mm -hmm. uh, I haven't actually used pipes before. Mm -hmm. So it was a very good uh, incident that I presented the chapter because I really wanted to to understand what's going on. And I feel that I have a better grasp. Yeah. What is yeah. happening now. <laughs> I, even though like, I'm not sure if like those guys would be very useful in real life scenarios, especially like the T-type, the T-type for me, it's more complicated than. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, that's what I was kind of thinking the same thing. I was like, these seem like they're for very specific situations. Exactly. And in, in learning R, there's so much to learn and there's so much information. And it's kind of, I see these things and I'm like, okay, I, I feel like I need to keep focused on the things that I'm actually going to be learning. But it's good to know, like what you were saying, it's just good to know that these things exist and that they could be useful somewhere down the line if you're in a really specific situation but it's, I can see how they could be helpful. Yeah, I think it's better to at least know what they, what they mean or, or what they are, uh, even if you don't use it, use them in your code. But yeah. Uh, Daniel, any comments? Uh, okay, great. Uh, pipes had always 
been told yes, like a master user operator. And yeah, it's nice to see that it's selective indeed. And so we are quite early. I don't know if you'd like to continue with functions a bit or just call it a day and For, I mean, I, for me, I guess I'd go either way. It depends what you want to do, but I know I've always kind of functions um, are kind of difficult for me to understand. So that seems like a big thing for me. So, I mean, personally, I wouldn't mind if we saved it for its own thing to kind of get into, like, be able to get into that mindset because functions has been something that I've kind of struggled with. So. I mean, that's just my input. It, it's fine if you want to move ahead with it a little bit today, but I'm- No, <laughs> well, I, I don't because <laughs> I'm also, I, I've, uh, I've always been recommended like by more advanced star users to use functions, but I've never ever in my code use function. I know what it is. I know that you can make your own for code that you use repeatedly. But yeah, and I've obviously not yet finished preparing the chapter, but we could, you know, run through the very first uh, part of it. But yeah, we'll probably just continue next week with the chapter just to give us also a, a sense of completion for today's yeah. meeting. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, that works for me. I know functions was like, I've tried a few times to kind of learn them and it's something about something about them is just kind of confusing for me. So I'm looking forward to just getting somebody else's input on it and just seeing how other people are learning, you know, how you're learning functions. I think that would help me out because I am i can't like wrap my head around them for some reason, you know, like I feel like I'm getting it and then I'm like, it all just falls apart. I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing here, you know? So it's, I'm, I'm looking forward to kind of getting into that and uh, trying to wrap my head around that one a little bit better. Me too, me too. Okay, so yeah, Daniel, agree. Uh, no problem above the mic. Uh, Zoom is very weird and always uh, has issues, right? <laughs> so yeah, great. So that was all for today, and see you guys next week for the functions chapter. <laughs> bye. Okay. Have a good week. You too. Bye.